In the name of God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, welcome to this service of worship. Let us pray. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. I invite you to now come into a time of uh, contemplation and reflection on your lives and how far short of the glory of God we've all come. And I just invite you into this time of uh, confession of sin, if you'll join me. Gracious God, in whom we live and move and have our being, how far short of your glory we have fallen. At times we worship at an altar to an unknown God. We work and live as though it is you who need our service. But the time for such ignorance is over. We repent of idolatry, self-worship, and making a God in our own image and turn to you in Christ for mercy and forgiveness of our many sins. Amen. People of God, I have good news for you. Who is in a position to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is ascended into heaven, who is seated at the right hand of God and is indeed interceding for you. Thanks be to God. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Amen. So we thought we'd try something a little different tonight, given that... Uh, our circumstances are a little different and things are moving along and developing in the world around us. And um, let's take the opportunity tonight, I've asked um, everybody present, both Jill and myself, to prepare a proclamation of the gospel on a selection of scripture. So I will be preaching from Acts and uh, our, our uh, friend Jill here will be preaching from First Peter. As we approach the scripture now, let us uh, pray for the miracle of transformation that God ordains by the hearing of his word, that people would come to faith and that uh, those who have faith would increase in their joy and be transformed and equipped for every good work. Let us pray. Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, King of this universe. You caused the canon of scripture to be written to teach us, reproof us, correct us, and train us in righteousness. May your word complete us by our hearing, believing, and action. And may your word equip us for every good work. Amen. Our reading comes from Acts chapter 17. It's Paul's sermon to the Athenians at the Areopagus. So, Paul, standing in the midst of the Areopagus, said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. For as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I found also an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you, the God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man. Nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place, that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. Yet he is not actually far from any one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as even some of your own poets have said, for we are indeed his offspring. Being then God's offspring, we ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imaginations of men. Times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent 
because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed, and of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. Now, when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, but others said, we'll hear you again about this. So Paul went out from their midst, but some men joined him and believed, among whom also were Dionysus the Areopagite and a woman named Damaris, and others with them. This is the word of the Lord. What we have here is one of two major illustrations of what's called a redemptive analogy that's used in proclamation of the gospel. We see the first one on Pentecost when Peter takes a current event that was happening around the people And he went to the source of their knowledge of God and their culture, and he said, this is just what Joel had talked about. This is the day that God's spirit has poured out on his people, on his sons and daughters, and they're going to be saying all these great things about God. And many people came to faith. It was a a huge uh, turnover rate for Peter when he preached that sermon. And here in Athens now, several years later and several thousand miles away, Paul is preaching and he is in a completely different culture with a completely different group of people. And he spends the day basically acting like a YouTube troll in the comments section of this video. He's arguing with the people in the forum, the marketplace, about this and that, and debating theology and philosophy. The Athenians love to debate and talk endlessly about any type of foreign wisdom. You come in with a new idea, they'd want to hear about it. So Paul takes full advantage of that and goes right to work. He looks at what they have embedded in their culture. He learns about what kind of people they are at the very core of their being, and he says, oh, you Athenians, I see that in every way you are very religious. In your meticulousness, in your, your desire not to offend some God that you don't even know, you have set up an altar to the unknown God to placate him in case you missed him. Well, guess what? I'm here to tell you the fullness of who he is. I've got good news for you and some bad news, but we'll get into that. So, this is a great example of why I think as a, as a church in this country that has for many generations successfully sent out missionaries around the world and has, has contributed to the building up of the church around the world, I think um, what we're witnessing in this country is a little bit of um, some burnover. There's, there's a lot of people that have heard of Jesus, but they haven't really seen anything of him. They don't really know how to relate to him. And uh, I think it's a shame because there's so many people in this country that have such a zeal and such a fire and a passion for the gospel. And uh, it just seems like there's no connecting with their neighbors. And I wonder if it's not because we have complete, we have so become inundated with our own, own culture that we've, we've lost the connection for the redemptive analogy that Paul is taking advantage of here. We're just a bunch of fish swimming around in our little fishbowl and we don't even know what water is. We're, we're just so desensitized to what it is that's unique about our culture and what it is uh, where that bridge exists between our culture and the gospel. And so I think this country could really benefit from the uh, fruit of generations past labor in planting churches all over the world, if they, this is an open invitation to basically anybody that's listening, uh, Godfrey, if you're hearing this in Uganda, just know you are more than welcome to come to Herkimer and and evangelize and preach the gospel. Um, and anyone else around the world, uh, America is, is, a, is a good land for planting the gospel. And we need the worldwide church community here in this country, one, to help us realize that Christianity is much bigger than those four walls that we sit in on Sunday morning. But, um, you know, actually the gospel has a worldwide aim and a, with a razor-sharp focus. So... 
that's my pitch for foreign missionaries. Come into America, help spread the gospel. Uh, you can stay at the, uh, at the parsonage in Herkimer. I'd be glad to put you up, feed you, take care of you, and uh, show, you, show you around. So come on down. Now, as for this sermon itself, the good news and the bad news that Paul shares, I think it's important to understand Paul hated Christians at first. I mean, he hated the Reformation that happened in Judaism in the first century. He hated it. He, you can read in Acts chapter 9 that um, Paul went to the high priest's breathing threats of murder against the disciples of the Lord. Breathing threats of murder. You know when somebody is like a really big fan of baseball, you might say they eat, sleep, and breathe baseball? Murder was the air that Paul breathed against the disciples of Jesus. He was fanatic. He was passionate. He hated them with every fiber of his being. Why? Why the fanatical hatred? You see, what it comes down to is this. The news he heard about Jesus, as he no doubt heard from the mouth of uh, Stephen when he was being stoned to death um, and had possibly heard before that, Um, The news about Jesus, if it was true, if it was true, and I believe it is, I hope you believe it is, Paul had committed his entire life to to a tremendous mistake. He had wasted his life. Nobody... Nobody likes their comfortable, predictable, in control worldview being flipped over. Because it means everything up to the present, your whole life long, has been a waste. Now, there's some small examples of things that overturn our lives from time to time. That they're bumps in the road. We hopefully uh, don't fall into despair, but we redouble our efforts. We overcome. We learn something, and we grow. They're good for character development and and growth. Um, You know, you might find yourself right now in your second or third year of college and you've had to switch to online classes. Maybe even you've realized that you need an entirely different major for the career that you want to pursue now and none of your classes transfer over into anything other than electives and you've got to start from scratch almost. It's not the end of the world. You can get through that. There are people that do that. It's not the end of the world. It's better to find out at this point in your life than 10 years later after you've been working away at a job that you hate to find that actually you're called to do something else. Then what do you do? Um, You could be, you could end up getting your world flipped over, coming home one night and finding the, uh, your spouse has left you for another person. And the last 40 years or however, six months that you were together, you realize you didn't exactly see things the way they really were. It's not the end of the world. It's the end of the world that you thought you knew. But there's still a lot of the lay of the land that's still familiar to you. You can still get up and find your way. But the change that Paul experienced was so much greater because how you relate to God, how you see God, informs the way that you see everything else. It's like the disappointment is probably the same as if you spend your whole life eating healthy, working out, not smoking or drinking, and then you end up getting lung cancer at 30 anyway. What was the point? What was the point is what Paul has got to be saying to himself when he finds out that the nature of God was completely different from what he had presumed before. You see, Paul was a a very successful Pharisee. He had 
all the diplomas and honors that anyone looking to make a career out of what he did would need. He had much to boast about. He thought he was doing a great service to God by hunting down and, and, and killing the followers of Jesus. But when he heard the gospel, it turned things around for him. And so, ultimately, what I hope to do in telling you about the gospel is to help you make wise investments with your time, your money, and indeed your life. I'm not a financial advisor, um, but I don't want you to make foolish investments with the limited resources you've got for this life. The gospel is incredibly earth-shattering bad news for the proud and the self-sufficient. It's the best news in the world for the weak and the humble. The gospel that Paul preaches to the Athenians at the Areopagus is that you cannot pick yourself up by your own bootstraps. It flies in the face of the American gospel even. It's bad news to us. It insults our pride because we want to be in control. We want to be powerful. We want to be in a spot where we can come to the table with God and negotiate with him as a peer or a superior. But that's not the case. He tells us in verses 24 through 25, the God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything. Since it's actually he himself who gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. If you feel strong, if you feel like you're able to barter with God or purchase his favor as though you have something of yourself to offer him, you're deluding yourself. That's precisely, that's precisely what threatened Paul and his worldview. As I said, he had top honors from every credentialing organization he needed. He had the support of the Pharisees, the priests. He had uh, letters of giving him authority to take people in chains back to Jerusalem for punishment. He even had Roman citizenship to throw in there. But when he heard the gospel that actually everything he had counted for nothing and that actually what he needed was God, not the other way around. It wasn't God who needed Paul. It was Paul who needed God. Um, when he came to that point, he had to have said something along the lines of, what have I worked for my whole life? What does it count for? been a waste. I've wasted my life. People do not waste your life going down the wrong path thinking that it's God who needs you. The good news to the weak, to the humble, is that the gospel is not a help wanted sign. God, God doesn't have an office at 102 Church Street that says help wanted. He's got a sign out there that says help offered. God loves to serve those who know that they need his mercy and grace every day. God loves to serve us. It's not a matter of us being what God needs us to be, but it's the revelation that Jesus became precisely what it is that we needed. Jesus became what we needed. He became the perfect sacrifice for our sins. He reconciled us to God. He took us who were enemies of God and made us guests at his table. 
Jesus became what it is that we needed. So what's it mean to be a Christian? What then shall we do? Well, it means investing your time wisely. It means waking up every morning with the humble recognition that God is what you need more than anything else. Saying, blessed are you, O Lord my God. I awake because you have sustained me through the night. You have gotten me through the night. And I know that no matter what may come today, if I have you, if you are with me, then I have everything I need. I have everything I need. It means living with that kind of attitude and that kind of view of everything and view of yourself and the world and the things that you have, the things that are given to you by God and saying, it's worth giving up everything for because everything in my life that I have thought was gain up to this point was actually lost. But losing all of that, I now see it as gain for the sake of knowing Jesus and the power of his resurrection. So, you can start being a missionary of this gospel right now. It doesn't hurt to try. We don't necessarily, we're not, we're not waiting on people coming into this country to get the ball rolling. It's already gotten rolling with you hearing this. Uh, do not be discouraged. While Peter preached at Pentecost and he got thousands of people whose lives were changed by the gospel, not that they were thrown into despair, but that their lives were thrown into joy and security. Paul had only a handful of people that were persuaded, uh, converted at the Areopagus in Athens. Um, and this is really the only <laughs> sermon of his that we get in, in Acts. If we, if we only had this, if we only knew that Paul preached this sermon in Athens, we'd think he was a terrible church planter and he should have gotten a job making tents or something like that. But he did not get discouraged by, um, you know, some less, less than competitive feedback that Peter had gotten in Jerusalem. Uh, he continued to preach the gospel and he planted churches all over uh, what's present day Turkey and Greece and uh, made it all the way to Rome. Uh, he had plans to go beyond that even. But um, he was ultimately faithful to what God had called him to do and God was faithful to his promise to build his church. And that's precisely what Jesus has promised to do. He says he will build his church. Um, we have only to respond with gratitude and humble recognition that um, he is everything we need. He's making everything happen that we need. And uh, we should be honored to be a part of the mission that he's ordained. Our scripture reading is 1 Peter 3, verses 13 through 22. Who is going to harm you if you are eager to do good? But even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear what they fear. Do not be frightened. But in your hearts, set apart Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. It is better, if it is God's will, to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. For Christ died for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. For he was put to death in the body, but made alive by the Spirit, through whom also he went and preached to the spirits in prison, who disobeyed long ago when God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being built. In it, only a few people, eight in all, were saved through water. And this water symbolizes baptism that now saves you also, not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a good conscience towards God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, 
who has gone into heaven and is at God's right hand with angels, authorities, and powers in submission to him. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Suffering, fear, death. These are words that we've heard a lot lately, words that have been top of mind, if you will, for many months. We hear of those suffering from the coronavirus, and this inspires fear in us. We hear of death, and this inspires more fear in us, perhaps. There are constant reminders around us of all the suffering and fear and death that we experience every day, even if we never leave our homes. COVID-19 has affected our society deeply and will continue to do so for the foreseeable future. And certainly many of those who are suffering have been and are Christians. Many who have died have been Christians. And we might wonder why it is that God is allowing that sort of thing to happen, with Christians even. But the kind of suffering that COVID-19 is meeting out on the world is not really the suffering that Peter is talking about in his letter. Peter is talking in verse 14, he says, but even if you should suffer for what is right. The suffering that Peter is talking about is the suffering that we experience when we are preaching the gospel. So the suffering Peter is talking about is the suffering for doing right, the suffering for standing up for our faith. In America these days, it is less likely that we will be imprisoned for our faith although that is becoming more likely as the days go on. But we may be imprisoned, we may be maligned, we may be ostracized when we do stand up for our faith, when we say that this is what we believe, when we turn against what the world is telling us is true and preach the gospel of truth to those who are maligning us. We will suffer, we know that we will suffer when we stand up for the gospel, when we preach the gospel. If Jesus has promised us anything, he has promised us that. But he has promised us so much more than that. But we will get that to that in a moment. When Peter said, even if you, when he said in verse 13, who is going to harm you if you are eager to do good? Here he is saying, that if we do suffer for doing what is right, any harm that may come to us will not be harm that will last forever. It will be harm in this life, but not harm in that life, in the next life. It is as we see in Matthew chapter 10, verse 28, where Jesus says, Do not be afraid of those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. So we should not fear the harm that comes from those who can only kill the body. We should fear the harm that comes from the one who can kill both body and soul. Peter goes on to say, even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. He says, do not fear what they fear. Do not be frightened. We should not be frightened of any harm that may come to us when we preach the gospel because that harm cannot destroy us. That harm will not be from the one who can kill both body and soul. So we do not need to fear that harm or those who might bring us that harm. We need to fear God, the one who can bring us eternal harm, eternal death. But that fear should not be the kind of fear that has no love in it. That fear should be respect. That fear should be 
not wanting to upset the one who loves us. And so that fear of God should actually be a holy fear, a fear that brings us more in line with his will, not a fear to drive us away, but a fear to bring us closer. So do not fear what they fear, those who are afraid of the things of this life, those who are afraid of losing their life in this life but not worried about losing their life in the next. What we should fear is God, so that we do not need to fear what they fear. We do not need to be frightened, no matter what happens to us or to this world. But Peter goes on, Do not be frightened, but in your hearts set apart Christ as Lord. When we do that, when we set apart Christ as Lord, that will remove the fears that we might have, that will drive them away from us. The positive antidote for the fear that we might feel for things of this world is actually setting apart Christ as Lord, because then we will realize that he is Lord of everything. Lord of this entire world, and when we set him apart as our Lord, then no matter what happens to us, we know that he has us in his hands, that he is our Lord and our protector. And our fear of him as our Lord and protector will drive out all other fears. And it will help us to show those who are maligning us what our faith is all about, and it will bring them closer to God, and it will shame them for their maligning of us. And in their maligning of us, in our not displaying our fear or not having our fear, and them noticing that we have no fear, this gives us an opportunity to preach the gospel, and an opportunity to tell them what exactly it is that has driven out our fear, what exactly it is that gives us the hope that we have. It will help us to give an answer to everyone who asks us to, who asks us what the reason is for the hope that we have. And so we should take that opportunity to tell them about Jesus and about all that he has done for us. Now, it would be very easy for us when we do this to be angry about it, to strike back at the people who are maligning us with bitterness or anger or or any negative emotion because they are saying bad things about us and hurting us intentionally. But Peter says that we must not do it like that. When we give them the reason for the hope that is in us, we must do it with gentleness and respect because that is what will set us apart from those who are maligning us. When we can respond with love, when we can love our enemies as Jesus told us to, then that will show them what our faith really is, what faith in Jesus really looks like, and it will bring them closer to him. When we speak to others about the hope that is in us, we should do it without self-righteousness, without snottiness, without snarkiness, but just with love and respect. Now, we don't see much gentleness and respect in the world around us these days, it seems. It seems we are constantly at each other's throats, arguing about just about anything. But we need to be different. When people see that we are not afraid of what is going on around us and ask us for that hope, we need to respond in a way that is different, in a way that is not argumentative, but a way that is peaceful and joyful and loving and welcoming not judgmental at all. Because it is not our job to judge. That is God's job. That is our Lord's job, Jesus Christ, whom we have set apart in our hearts as Lord. And when we are giving our testimony about the hope that we have, when we are doing so with love and gentleness, we will be whispering, not shouting. Now, there's an old adage in the advertising world, 
I don't know if it's still said, but it used to be said that if you wanted to be heard, don't shout, whisper. Because especially now, people have developed a skill at ignoring the shouting because we are shouted at so much. But we are tuned in to the whisper because we wonder what that's all about. So if we're whispering, not shouting, people will want to know what exactly it is that we have to say. They will want to know what the secret is. And we can tell them. And Peter goes on to say that when we are giving our testimony, we need to keep a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against our good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. Once again, because we are speaking with gentleness and peace, not anger or bitterness, the people who have maligned us for being Christians, we will essentially prove them wrong and they will be ashamed that they ever said anything bad against us. We don't know that they'll ever apologize, but that's not the point. We just need to show how we are different from them, how different a life that knows Jesus is from a life that doesn't. To show them the joy and the peace that we have and draw them closer to that. It will show them what faith means for our daily lives. It will show that we are not counterfeit Christians, ones who might know the doctrine, ones who might go to church every Sunday, but without a changed heart. It will show that we are true Christians, true followers of Jesus. Because being a Christian does not mean that we should live at church, helping with bake sales or even sitting in the pew every Sunday morning, or whatever it is that we may do at church, helping out with events. But rather, being a Christian means living as the church, which means preaching the gospel, showing love to those who may be our enemies, showing love to each other especially, and showing love to the world, and bringing the gospel message of Jesus to that world so that they can be saved. As some wise person once said, sitting in church doesn't make you a Christian any more than sitting in a, a garage makes you a car. But there are many people who do sit in a church thinking that that is how one becomes a Christian. They can sit in, in church and listen to the preaching and even take communion and do all the churchy things that they might want to do. But their hearts are not changed. Their hearts are not broken for all the things that they have done that grieve the Lord. And so they cannot be called Christians. Our example is Christ. And he suffered. He suffered for us. Peter says in verse 17, It is better if it is God's will to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. For Christ died for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. That's our example. To suffer for the right. To bring others to God. Now obviously we cannot save sins through our suffering or, or bring people into salvation through our suffering as Jesus did. Only Jesus could do that. But it is through the example of our suffering that we can show people that our lives are different that we are different, that we have a peace that passes all understanding and therefore bring them to Christ. Our suffering is not a punishment from God. God never punishes us in that way. Our suffering may be the consequences of our actions that God lets us suffer, possibly to teach us something. But our suffering beyond that is a chance to show the world what our faith really means. And it is an invitation to blessing. Peter said back in verse 14, if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Now this may not, probably won't be, a blessing in this life. It could be. But we are assured that we will be blessed in the life to come if we are suffering for doing what is right, if we are suffering for living out our faith. God will bless us with a place 
in a mansion he has prepared for us, a place at his table at his heavenly banquet, a place in his kingdom where we can love and honor and worship him forever. He will give us the blessing of an even closer fellowship with Jesus in our lives here and in the life to come. Jesus' triumph over death because he died to bring us to God becomes our triumph over death. So we don't even need to fear death because we know that Christ died for our sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous to bring us to God. He was put to death in the body but made alive by the Spirit. And we too, after we are dead in our bodies, will be made alive again in the Spirit. We will participate not only in in death, but also in Jesus' resurrection. And we will live in those resurrected bodies forever, knowing the love and peace that only God can provide, provide for us. And once we have given ourselves to God, once we have made that commitment to set apart Christ as Lord in our hearts, then nothing, nothing, can ever separate us from God. Nothing can tear us from his hand. Jesus said as much in the Gospel of John, chapter 10, verses 27 through 29. He said, My sheep listen to my voice. I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. No one can snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. Jesus holds us in his hand, and he will never let go. St. Paul said in Romans 8, verses 30 through 32, he said, excuse me, verse 31, what then shall we say in response to this? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? And he goes on to say, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Jesus Christ, our Lord. We are saved and we are safe in our Lord's hands, and he will never let go. So we do not need to fear what they fear. We do not need to be frightened because Jesus has us. Through his death and resurrection, we receive the salvation that he accomplished for us on the cross when we believe in him. Paul again talks about that in Ephesians 2, chapter 2, verses 8 through 9. He said, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. It is all what God has done for us, and we can do nothing to save ourselves. All we can do is give our hearts and our lives over to Christ. And when we do that, through Jesus' death and resurrection, we receive that salvation. Jesus was victorious over death through his resurrection, and through that he was given the right to judge. It is his right alone, not ours. And after he died... He preached that judgment to others. Peter goes on in verse 19 to say, after Jesus was put to death in the body but made alive by the Spirit, through whom also Jesus and the Spirit went and preached to the spirits in prison 
who disobeyed long ago when God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being built. So he preached judgment, but he also preached hope. He said, in it, that is the ark, only a few people, eight in all, were saved through water. And this water symbolizes baptism that now saves you also. So it is through our baptisms that we are saved, not just through our baptisms, but through the grace of God. In our baptism, God gives us that gift of salvation. So when we die and are resurrected through baptism, we share with Jesus in his death and his resurrection. And we are saved, just like those eight people in the boat with Noah so many years ago. The water not only was a source of judgment because it killed the wicked who were alive then, but it was also a source of salvation because it was how the ark floated and kept Noah and his family and all the animals on it from drowning. It was judgment for some, salvation for others. And that is what Jesus is. He is judgment for the wicked, but salvation for those who have faith in him and to put on his righteousness when they come to believe in him. And so Peter goes on to say, this baptism saves us, but it is not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a good conscience towards God. It saves us by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at God's right hand with angels, authorities, and powers in submission to him. Jesus is Lord. That was one of the earliest creeds there was in the church, and it is a creed that we can hang on to right now to take away our fear and give us hope. The greatest hope there is or was or ever will be, that we are saved by and through Jesus. So be self-controlled and alert. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him and he will flee from you. Standing firm in the faith because you know that your brothers through the world are undergoing the same kind of sufferings. And the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. To him be the glory and power forever and ever. Thanks be to God. Well, as you've uh, noticed, there's only two of us here this evening, and uh, we're, we're grateful for the opportunity we've got. Joe, I'm glad you could make it, but we're also mindful of our brothers, Brian and Mark, that are not able to be with us tonight. They're uh, called out to other ministry duties at the moment that have come up, and uh, you know, I just say the sheep always come first when it comes to these sort of things. So. Uh, the Lord be with you guys, and we're going to offer up some prayer for you now. Uh, and I just ask Jill to lift up uh, the whole of our community and indeed the world in prayer now. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we ask you to bring comfort and peace to all those who are suffering. We ask you to be with those who have lost loved ones during this time. We ask you to be with those who are ill. We ask you to be with their families, Lord, of those who have passed and of those who are still sick. Lord, we ask you to be with Brian Engel and Mark Sothersby and to those that they are ministering to this e today. We ask you, Lord, to give us strength and courage to lead the lives that you are calling us to lead. Lord, we ask you to give strength and courage to the clergy who serve you so that they can give encouragement, guidance, and wisdom 
to those who are called to go out and preach your word to the world. We ask you, Lord, to be present throughout this world to all those who suffer, especially those who suffer for preaching your gospel, for living out their faith, wherever they may be. Lord, we ask you to help them to know your presence and your peace, your joy and your hope so that they can turn hearts towards you and you can bring those people into your kingdom. Lord, we ask you for wisdom and courage in these trying times to know your will for us and to follow that will with dogged persistence and single-minded determination. Help us to see where we have sinned, Lord, and to always turn back to you to know your love and forgiveness. Help us, Lord, to be your hands, your eyes, your feet in this world, to show your love to others. Help us to love each other, but most of all, Lord, help us to love our enemies so that we can be examples of your love and live out your gospel in that way in our lives. We pray all these things in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Well, thanks for joining us this morning. And, uh, oh, <laughs> don't have my watch. Do you guys know what time it is? Of course. It's time to be a witness. So go out there and be a witness of the resurrected Jesus Christ. And may the Lord greet you on your way. May the Lord look favorably upon you. And may he secure you in his everlasting peace. Now and always, go in peace. Amen.